Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Vance Stevens. I'm uh, living in Penang, Malaysia right now. Um, I'm giving a presentation, which I'm going to share with you. Let me try and do that now. Um, this is a presentation for the TESOL uh, 2021 conference, which is virtual this year. And it's a pre-recorded presentation, and it's going to be given on um, March 25th, 2021. And it's part of the Materials Writers Interest Section and Career Path Development Professional Learning Network uh, academic session at that conference. Okay, my presentation is called Adapting to Whatever Happens, but there's a little bit more to it than that. Adapting to whatever happens, transitioning from blended learning to uh, blending into the new normal. And, uh, and that's me, Vance Stevens. There's some things you need to know about presentations that I give. I always write out my presentations in advance and put them online. And then I also create, well, the slideshow that you're looking at right now that's online as well. And there's a key to accessing these. And the key is advanced 21, advanced 2021 academic. So uh, I think this recording that I'm making right now is going to be a long version. I'll put it on YouTube and I'll put it in the slideshow. But um, you can read about what I'm doing here. And um, that's this text. Uh, there's a navigation here. Uh, so let's see, it's going to be pre about preparing for the new normal. And that all goes back there. And you can, uh, you can see, you can read about what I'm going to do. So I don't want to dwell too much on that. But I would like to point out that it has a navigation. So you can go, you can bounce around and go to the different parts. So just a, a little uh, a teaser here or uh, spoiler, we're going to be talking about Minecraft in the new normal. So, and these are the slides. So, um, anyway, remember that advanced 2021 academic, if you go to tinyurl.com advanced 2021 academic, you can read the presentation with all its links. And if you go to bit.ly uh, advanced 2021 academic, you can see the slides and you can follow all the links from there. So basically it's my handout. So uh, this is kind of a digital story. Now, um, my story is in three parts. It's about preparing for the new normal. That's actually what many teachers have failed to do prior to the pandemic, which led into entering the new normal, which uh, was having to resort to, resort to uh, ERT or emergency remote teaching. And then there's the future of the new normal, where we go from here. And if you click on any of these uh, links, it will take you to a place in that text, uh, as I just showed you earlier. So this one is about where did I click on. I clicked on uh, entering the new normal. So you can go and read about uh, what, I'm talk what I'll be talking about during this presentation. OK, this is one of the slides in the show about entering the new normal. So we'll come to that in a minute. So that's just navigating through my presentation. And it kind of starts out uh, with the blog posts that I made after I went to Thailand as an English uh, language specialist. And uh, I wrote a post, I went to Thailand and I gave workshops, uh, wrote a blog post about it. A lot of the text that you will see in that document that I created uh, as a backstory or show notes here is from this blog post. So that's me starting out my preparing teachers for the new normal, which is where I had been for a long time. I've, I've often used wikis and uh, online tools in my teaching and working with other teachers and in uh, encouraging that for materials development. And the workshops were about, the English language specialist workshops were uh, supposed to be about blended learning, teaching the teachers in-service teachers and occasionally some students there about blended learning. Now, blended is partly online, partly face-to-face. -face. That could be in dispute. That's one definition. 
I, I Googled it to find out. But I, I know people have different uh, ideas about blended learning, but uh, you're basically take, you're blending what you've got face to face and moving some of that online. However you do it, could be flipped learning, whatever. So here are the workshops uh, to do that. I created a syllabus here. And um, let's see. OK, I'll come over here. Oh, here we go. Uh, here are some multimedia tools that I used in blended learning to teach blended learning, just to give you an example of what I taught. So I'm teaching some um, um, background onto this. And I also uh, did image capture, screen capture, screen capture, screen casting, things like that, image manipulation online tools for doing that, free portal spaces. So that was that's the kind of thing that I was uh, including in my workshops. So the workshops had, uh, oh, I, should, I have to mention, because it was going from new normal, uh, from the old normal to new, to new normal. Now, this is, this is where we were in, the, in that transition. In January in 2020, you can see Bobby and I, my wife Bobby, on a plane, and we're surrounded by people who are wearing masks. Uh, the guy on Bobby's right is our one of our minders at the um, at the Relo's office, taking us up to Chiang Rai, I believe. And then after the after this conference, I went to Cambodia for the Cam TESOL conference, and a lot of people, one of the presenters didn't uh, didn't come. The plenary speaker did come. He chose to stay in uh, Australia and pr present remotely. So this, we're starting to get an indication, an inkling of the fact that there's a pandemic going on. Um, after the, TESOL, the Camp TESOL conference, I went to Phuket. I went diving. Uh, everything seemed OK. I flew back to um, uh, Penang on um, Valentine's Day in 2020. That was the last time I got on a plane and the last time I got a haircut, as you can see. So now then. Uh, the course had an e-learning component. And here again, I was supposed to be teaching or actually consulting with people who want to learn more about this topic. And the, the e-learning, um, things started to get a little weird in about the middle of it. It went from uh, February to mid-February to mid-March, three weeks actually. And uh, it was couched in a wiki, but also in a Schoology uh, course to give it some, uh, to give people forums and things like that. And uh, but you can see what was going on in the recordings archive. So on the sidebar here, let's look at the recordings archive. So these are, we had, it looks like 11 webinars. And um, this is the last one. Um, I don't remember. It's it's blogged here. You can see what happened in that uh, workshop. Um, the next to last one, I had some people from Hong Kong talking about how they were coping with, what, with what, how their schools were closing, how they were how, how they were getting on with that, and that was on the 9th of March. So things had just closed. People were really starting to be aware that this was happening. Um, on uh, March 7th, I was talking about do-it-yourself learning management systems. Uh, March 5th, nobody arrived for that office hour, but a lady from Thailand tweeted and said she thanked me for giving me so many tricks because as she explained earlier in the tweet that she was uh, had been allowed to go on a trip for a festival because um, all her courses were in such good shape. She was allowed to do that. So. Um, that brings us back to the third and then to the first. The first was kind of a seminal mo moment in our workshops. So in February, we were still sort of transitioning to the new normal. In March 1st, we got, uh, we had Jeff LeBeau turn up uh, spontaneously, really. And he talked to me about uh, how he was handling the new normal uh, because he had, he was, he, I've known Jeff for a long time, and back in the start of the Web Two days, and he he has been uh, his classes, his, his interactions with peers have been kind of a mentor for me, uh, showing me 
showing us tools how to move our uh, our uh, teaching and our teacher training online. And he showed us in uh, in the video that you saw there uh, how he works in Blogger. He's been working in Blogger, and he got all his uh, Blogger and Google Drive, and he got all his materials put into this these places. Blogger is actually uh, you can see actually if I go to the to the uh, he shows us where he's his interface here. So this is uh, these are his Blogger uh, pages, which are different pages that everybody in his department uses. So he was he was very well set up from his background in blended learning to transition into the new normal. And um, so um, the course ended on the 11th. You saw some of the later webinars. But by then, we were getting, starting with Jeff and then these other people from Hong Kong, we were starting to get people who were coming on and wanting to talk about their uh, situations, about how they're uh, uh, coping. But the course ended. I tried to keep it going through uh, what I called the uh, community extension. And that didn't really take off anywhere, but it did lead to something called Talon, teaching and learning in isolation. And this is what Talon looks like on Facebook. Uh, we had, uh, we, I started the group in March 27th. So it was a couple of weeks after the end of the course. And um, the reason it started was that uh, people in my other communities were suggesting that we should have a space to uh, where we could meet online, talk informally about changes in their personal and professional context, what they were doing to help others in the pandemic. And so um, this also has a, there's a link here that you can click on from the slides. This takes you to the Talon uh, Google Doc that I set up. Okay, there it goes. Okay, it's taking us to the um, to the list of archive to the archives of webinars we did. So we had uh, 38 webinars, and uh, they just page down a little bit and see what who did them. Graham Stanley was with us. Heike Philp, Vicky Salmill, um, Gavin Dudney did one. Why the obsession with tools? Things like that. So we had people were coming on and volunteering to present these to present these webinars and we had a, a lot of them uh, but on about this time in mid-august things were starting to wane but this is something significant the last webinar we did uh, Doris Molero who's uh, was, talked about a uh, course she's doing in second life where she sets up narratives um, in Second Life, having the students develop narratives revolving around historical scenes, which she has set up. And she got one of the other participants, Minnie from China, involved in this, and she did a webinar on that. And, um, so that's the kind of thing we were doing uh, in that. And But as I said, things were kind of starting to wane. And so what I did was I didn't, I didn't want to go out with a whimper. I decided to go out with a bang. I shifted into Talon Squared. Talon Squared is teaching and learning in the new normal. Uh, it's still on Facebook. It has uh, I think over 200 members. Uh, let's see, okay, yeah, 226 members. People are still posting there. But it's not really active as far as webinars are concerned. Um, but it was... Um, by then, uh, also, well, uh, I, okay, so, so anyway, it, uh, I, I decided I would take my focus to the new normal. Now, uh, what is the new normal? It wasn't something I uh, took up in Talon, but it was something I was about to take up in Electronic Village Online. Um, you can say, what is the new normal? Not. It's not the old normal. Things are going to change. Things are changing. And there's probably not going to go back to the same way, or some people might. But, um, 
in my opinion, Zoom sort of attempts to graft old normal techniques often into a convenient online space. And this is why some people are bored with it when that happens ad nauseum. Uh, a lot of people are breaking out of that, learning, learning new ways to uh, use Zoom and other online spaces. But one thing the new normal does, well, obviously it involves hybrid teaching. So the old normal had blended learning where uh, you could assume you're going to be face-to-face -face with students. Hybrid teaching assumes you're going to be face-to-face -face with some students, but at the same time you're going to have some online students. Uh, but ultimately, I think the new normal is going to be finding ways of engaging students that aren't heavily based in Zoom or other replications of classroom-based learning ecologies, kind of like what Doris Malero was doing in her, um, her uh, Second Life projects. Okay, so to me, the future of the new learning for me, because that's what I do, is something like Minecraft. I've created a, a, an EVO session, Electronic Village Online session, uh, missions for Minecraft, and this is our syllabus. It has a live events um, pages. Okay, so if we go to live events, we can see what we did this uh, past EVO session, which was de in development, actually, from August onwards. Uh, but uh, we actually gave it in January and February, as we do every year. But uh, we had quite a lot of webinars in this one. There's a whole pages of them. Um, so that's an EVO wrap-up Zoom meeting. And um, you can see archives of what we do in uh, EVO Minecraft MOOC. One of the most interesting ones was the last one, where we went in a place, into a place in Minecraft called The End. To go to the end, you have to really have community support. And um, I've probably got a few too many browser pages open, but anyway, basically, there's a, that's a very interesting video. It's like a, a feature-length film. And um, we archive the things that we do and um, make a lot of videos. Okay, so why Minecraft? The reason I'm interested in Minecraft is it's creative. Every, it started in 2009, by the way. In 2009, teachers were starting to jump on it by the end of 2009. It was first released in 2009. And um, teachers quickly saw its potential. It's creative. Everyone is a builder. So you're able to exercise your critical thinking, your engineering skills, mathematical concepts, because things are marked off in blocks. It's highly gamified. Uh, my wife is over there fishing right now, and the reason she's fishing, she wants to catch saddles and things so she can put them on horses, and she gets experience points for doing that, and she's just doing that to pass time while I'm doing this presentation. So it's game. So many ways it's gamified. It's game based. It can be modified by teachers to to meet learning outcomes. It's quite important. So both of those aspects make Minecraft quite compelling. It's community based. They're extensive networks of people who are using Minecraft in education and a lot of resources you can find, you and both your students. And it's the participatory culture around it is quite uh, unique. You have to understand Minecraft to understand its culture, that is all the, the uh, YouTube videos that are created for it, the other people in the participatory culture, it's what's expected of you when you go into their, into their uh, Minecraft servers. Um, how they interact with one another. So this is uh, something that teachers need to absorb. Uh, you absorb that by getting in with other teachers or communities using Minecraft. It encourages communication. Um, student narratives. Um, I would get students to create things and explain what they had created. Multimedia productions. Uh, lots of students like to uh, create um, YouTube videos and put them on their YouTube channels. Uh, conversations with teachers and peers inside the environment. Uh, 
are also quite important. And also importantly, in, in, encourages research, reading, uh, listening also. That is, and the reading is in something like, uh, suppose you want to learn how to do enchantments. For example, you want to enchant your helmet so that you can breathe underwater, which would enable you to get into treasure chests or in sunken ships and things like that, or also just look at the coral reef. So um, that's part of the gamification. Uh, you're, you want to do things like that. You want to learn how to do them from other people. You want to explain to other people how you did it. So, uh, and you have to research uh, how you did it. These are, these are some of the affordances of Minecraft. So I said it's gamified, but also game-based. That is, it can be modified by teachers. And just one example popped up at the end of our recent EVO sessions. Um, the, uh, one of the teachers, one of the moderators there, on the day that the Mars rover landed on Mars, set up a game, uh, a Mars game, and invited students to visit it. And uh, I said that uh, this was a good example of in the hands of a teacher who can massage the environment in Minecraft, clear learning objections can be accomplished. The, student, the teacher could be a science or a language teacher seeking to capitalize on a current event with their students engaged around the topic, whatever. So um, this is an important aspect of Minecraft. Kids want to play Minecraft and incidentally learn English. So Marianne Schmolchitz is a colleague of mine in EPO. Uh, she has a son named Philip. Some years ago, Philip, 11 years old, gave a presentation at the Reform Symposium talking about Minecraft. Uh, I went to visit Philip in Croatia with my wife, and he and his brother sat across from me and talked to me in fluent English. And they said that before they started playing Minecraft, they didn't know English quite so well, but as they watched the uh, videos, they didn't understand a word. But they said meaning emerged. So uh, they wanted to learn English. There's a, there's a lot more about, uh, we have a Pedagogy of Minecraft page in our wiki, and uh, that has uh, many publications that my colleagues and I and others have written and also our presentations, and then the, uh, those are up through 2020, and then the 2021 presentations are here at the, um, I've shown them to you already, at the live events page there. So you can find out a lot about us in these spaces. Okay, well, you might want to learn English or also Japanese. Uh, there's something called Kotoba Miners, where um, James York has set up uh, a community. But actually, he was teaching uh, he, he was teaching his students using Minecraft, but he had he was using teachers to come in to in, in, be language informers for his students. But the teachers he found lingered and tried to use Minecraft to learn Japanese. And after the student experiment dissolved after a, a semester, the teachers remained. And so he's actually, I think, revived that, Kotoba Miners. So you can read an interview with him about it here, or you can read a chapter in a book that he wrote on Kotoba Miners. So uh, in the last, um, the last EVO Minecraft MOOC, we had an elementary student named Finch who showed me how to complete circuits in Minecraft. Let's have a look at that because I think it's quite interesting. I've got it queued, it's queued here, uh, that link queues that uh, time equals 1,282 click, kick, uh, clicks, ticks, 1,282 kick, ticks takes us to this place right here. Let's see what it... So, uh, I need a repeater on like, there. Mm -hmm. This won't work if it's mm -hmm. facing like that. Mm -hmm. Gotta fake the thing you want to activate. Okay, so this is what this is what I want, okay. right? So you need to fake... So you need to stand on the target block and then oh, place that's... it down on the... So, see here, if, I, if you activate the thingy... Okay, watch this piece of 
redstone dust. When I shoot it, it and won't it, activate that redstone sure. dust. But he's because it's the wrong way, way around. There's oh, okay. It's got to be a certain way for it to work. Like it's got to go from force to the thing has to backwards. the thingy has to be facing trying to what you want to act. Explain it to me. Okay, so I got it. You've got to flip. Oops. Always okay. Thank you. So flip it to flip it though. I have to be behind it then, like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Here we go. And then the redstone. Okay, redstone is there already. Uh, I mean, uh, connected. Connected to something. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that that in EVO the redstone doesn't work like that. You've got a. Mm. Okay, here. Mm -hmm. Just okay, tell him, sorry. Tell him. Uh, make it... Uh, it's gotta go like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, can I show you this? <laughs> sure. I'm learning too. Sorry. Mm -hmm. You've got it with EVO. The, the redstone circuit. With EVO, the redstone doesn't really work, so you've got to make it come around. It has to touch the the redstone lock uh, directly for it to work. Mm -hmm. Now. Okay. Yes. Okay. So now. And now, shoot the target. <laughs> All right. It works. Yay! Yay! Whoa! Okay. All right. So that's where I think the potential is for environments and ecologies, learning ecologies like Minecraft to supplant, to, to be uh, more prominent in the new normal. And another reason that Minecraft works, which I've kept with me for 40 years, is from Earl Stevick's book in 1982, uh, Teaching and Learning Languages. Wisdom from the Past. He says that the quality of the learning that takes place when we focus our attention only on the items to be learned is different from and probably inferior to the quality of learning that's incidental to something else we're trying to do. So this is really the secret of Minecraft. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening to me. And this is Vance Stevens uh, in Penang, Malaysia. And thanks a lot. <laughs>